Uh, my name is Dr. Alyssa Billfield, and I'm going to be facilitating the seminar. I actually started at UW last year as a, a new faculty member. I've been at University of Arizona in Tucson beforehand, and this class was my first <laughs> class that I taught in the winter. And as many of you may remember, kind of taking yourself back to last year, things were a lot different. So there weren't quite as many uh, folks here in person. A lot of people were participating uh, either via our Zoom sessions or recordings. So again, really exciting to see um, lots of folks here and all geared up uh, for this winter seminar, which of course I'm biased, but it's going to be incredibly exciting. So um, you are very lucky to be a part of the sessions that uh, we'll get to partic participate in over the quarter. So I am going to get started. Um, and hopefully everyone's in the right place. This is uh, Nutrition 400. It's also co-listed as Nutrition 500. So we have combined undergrad and grad students participating in the seminar. And the theme for this year is certifying sustainability in the food system. So we're going to be looking at one of my favorite topics and a topic that's really at the center of my research as well and my personal interests, which are um, certifications in the food system. And so the session for today is going to serve as an introduction to the course overall. So we'll handle kind of all of the nitty gritty logistics. And then I'll also introduce the theme a bit. But the goal is for me not to talk too much about the topic, but for y'all to be able to learn from this really amazing list of expert speakers that we have lined up for the quarter. Okay, so here's what we're going to touch on today. I'm sure you've had a lot of similar experiences over the course of the first week of the quarter. Um, you know, usually it's kind of like a soft entry into all the work that you'll have forthcoming. Uh, but this class is pretty straightforward. It's just one credit. It's not too much of a heavy lift. And it's more really meant to provide uh, folks who are interested in the food system with really sort of intellectually stimulating topics to be able to um, delve deeper. So I'll give some of those introductions to the course overall. We'll learn a little bit about each other as well. I'll give uh, an overview of the seminar, and then we'll talk more specifically about this idea of uh, certifications in the food system and how they um, have the potential to enhance sustainability across a variety of areas. And then we'll get ready for um, who we're going to hear from next week. Okay, so this is me. I'm Dr. Alyssa Billfield. Um, I'm currently an assistant teaching professor in uh, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, but I'm core faculty in the Food Systems Program, so I see a lot of familiar faces, which is great. Um, and I was giving a guest lecture yesterday as well in another class, saw some other familiar faces. Um, so please, at any point, introduce yourself to me. If you see me wandering around campus um, or after or before the seminar, I really love to get to know folks. And you're welcome to reach out um, via email as well um, and Canvas. So my background is really interdisciplinary. I come to uh, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences with a background in political science. That's what I studied when I was an undergrad. Thought I was going to be a lawyer in uh, environmental policy. That never happened. I instead got a master's degree in um, environmental planning and international development um, over in London. And then I committed myself to working in environmental policy. So actually, this picture of a bunch of food waste, <laughs> it's not taken exactly from the work that I was doing at the state level government. But uh, one of my jobs there was calculating the recycling rate for the state. And my other job was actually watching um, loads of waste that should have been recycled or composted get tipped in landfills and other waste management facilities. Um, it's a long story. Happy to catch you up on that. Um, but I was witness to a lot of the overconsumption and uh, loss that happens uh, in the food system, as you can see from this picture. Um, I went on to actually work in a totally different space. I co-founded 
a food literacy and cooking education nonprofit called The Cookbook Project that ran um, over an eight year period. It recently became uh, absorbed into another nonprofit organization that operates nationally called Common Threads. Um, but at the time we used um, food culture as a lens for teaching young people about the connection between food, health, and the environment. So all of you who are food systems majors, um, that's probably, for many of you, a topic that's near and dear to your heart. Hel had a lot of fun, worked in a lot of different communities, led workshops in 14 different countries. Uh, there are still a lot of folks out there who are using the Cookbook Project uh, curriculum, which, which is really wonderful to see. And then finally, um, the picture to, I guess it's the far right for y'all, um, is a photo of uh, a family of coffee farmers that I worked with in Guatemala. So when I was a PhD uh, candidate, I first sort of, it first sort of sparked my interest into the impact of food system certifications on the food system. And more specifically, the research I was doing with coffee farmers in Guatemala looked at the impact of fair trade certification on gender equity in coffee cooperatives and coffee federations. Um, and that led me into, it was kind of like a rabbit hole, and I just became fascinated with certifications in the food system, did another research study in Sri Lanka with tea farmers. That led me to um, the fair trade certification as it's being Im implemented in the USA, uh, and I recently got involved in the upcycled food certification as well. So all of this kind of spurred what we're gonna to get to enjoy together this quarter, which is uh, just a really uh, fascinating list of speakers who are gonna be presenting to you about a variety of certifications in the food system. And my work personally in coffee and tea um, led to a, a book publication, which is really exciting. So I was able to publish a book um, last spring that sort of showcased the research from uh, my coffee and tea studies, um, mostly it was from the perspective of the farmers, so how the farmers actually view the certifications, fair trade, organic, um, biodynamic as well. Um, the third one we won't necessarily touch on in this course, um, but is kind of in the production side. And then, of course, these are my dogs. Um, this used to be really important when everyone was kind of doing COVID lectures, because sometimes my dogs in recordings or in like live Zoom sessions would start barking, right? Uh, we probably won't get to hear from them this quarter, although who knows? It kind of depends on how some of our Zoom sessions go and what y'all choose. Uh, but these guys uh, are really cute. We've got Hoogly in the upper right. Abby's the one wearing the kind of dog booties. She's got really sensitive paws. And then Dorje uh, with his tongue out at the bottom there. Um, they do like to go hiking, um, although the winter in Washington, they tend to just kind of take it easy. Okay, our TA is actually at a conference right now. She will be here um, live next week, so she'll do kind of a brief intro then. Um, but our TA for the course is Ali Klonch. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. Ali, if you're out there, I hope that was okay. Um, never said her name out loud. Um, Ali is currently a PhD student, so we're really lucky to have uh, a PhD student as the TA for the course. Um, she's also in my department, uh, Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences, and she has uh, a really strong interest in some of the topics that are aligned with the seminar. So um, environmental and occupational epi, and then also um, food justice, food systems, and agricultural um, worker health and safety, which definitely cross cuts with um, a lot of what we'll talk about, especially in the beginning part of this seminar. Um, and she's added some personal notes here. She sells vintage clothing, loves live music, and can be found singing karaoke. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll convince her to sing something for us uh, if, if we need to, you know, if we need to stall for tech reasons or something like that. Um, so look forward to seeing Allie next week. Um, she's the person you should email if there are any kind of logistical issues or if something comes up. Um, and she's also going to be the one um, grading uh, the weekly reviews if you're in the 400 level. Okay, so this is the time that I would like to hear from you. Um, and of course, I'll share this info with Ali as well. Um, what are you studying at UW? So this seminar attracts folks from all across campus. It'd be great to see um, what people are involved in.
Okay, excellent. Biology, health, public health, food systems, nutrition, and health, biochemistry, nursing, law, society, and justice. We've got some business folks. Wow, a lot of people from across campus, anthropology, sociology, masters of public health. Wow, this is quite an interesting group. This is going to be fantastic. I think the questions that are, come, are going to come from this group are going to be really interesting. And I'm sure all of the folks coming to speak to the group are going to be, yeah, just very impressed with the diversity of perspectives. Excellent. This is great. So majority of folks, it looks like public health, biology are kind of the front runners here. But then really, I mean, there is a lot of folks from across campus. So that's really exciting. OK, awesome. We'll keep entering in this data. Um, this will continue going on. And I think for folks who weren't able to be here in person today who might be watching the recording, you can also go in and um, add your info as well. So please do that, because we'll have a couple different um, pull everywheres in this session. Awesome. This is great. OK, the next question is, where are you from? I always like to see, uh, you know, where people are coming from. Excellent. Very cool. A nice geographic spread as well. This is wonderful. Uh, it'll be particularly interesting to hear um, from folks outside of the US, because um, some of these certifications tend to show up more um, in some countries versus others, um, what your exposure to these certifications have been in your home country. This is great. And I'm sure our speakers will also be interested to know about that as well, um, because some of the certifications are fairly recent, like within the last um, five to 10 years. OK, excellent. Sometimes there, you know, we get some jokers in this one who put pins in funny places. That's cool, too. <laughs> excellent. OK, great. And again, folks who are listening to the recording, make sure you enter your info in here, too. OK, so now I'm going to get into kind of the, the details of the course. Um, the syllabus is available on Canvas. The Canvas site doesn't have a ton of content. But that makes it easier to navigate. Um, and that's mostly because, again, this is a one credit course. The goal of the course is really for you to come and be engaged in these really uh, fascinating topics by fascinating speakers and to reflect on them. Nothing more um, complicated than that. So hopefully this is uh, one of the sort of lower level lifts for you this quarter. Um, so the classroom environment is its a really big seminar, as you can see. We're not going to have a ton of interaction, per se. Um, but you will have the opportunity to be here and to ask questions to some really interesting folks. Um, so to the extent that you can be here in person, I do really um, encourage that for those sessions. So in terms of contacting us, many of you have, have already uh, reached out, and you're aware that you can re uh, reach us via Canvas. You can also send emails as well, but if, if it's something about the class, um, it's better to reach out via Canvas. Um, you're welcome to schedule office hours if there's a topic that's really of interest to you. Happy to talk more with you about that. Um, and and if, your interest, if your interests overlap with Ali and I, we're also really happy to chat with you um, about our work, about what you're interested in, all of that good stuff. Um, and you made it here today so you know uh, when and where the seminar is being held. Um, so this is straight out of the syllabus, but just a reminder for folks, if you're not already hyper aware, I know we've got a lot of public health folks in here. Um, the winter, we do tend to see a rise in respiratory illnesses, um, and that's no different now, even though you know things do look and feel different from last year, of course. So if you do feel sick or you have any symptoms at all, please, 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 um, stay home, take care of yourself, get better. You do not need to be here in person. And the great thing about this course, um, as I mentioned in the announcement yesterday, is everything is being recorded via Panopto. So if you do have to uh, miss the session and you can't be here in person, you can always um, follow up with those Panopto recordings. Um, we do have this interesting hybrid designation, and I know a lot of folks have been curious about that, and it's prompted a lot of questions. So I kind of went with the hybrid designation 
um, to allow us to have guest speakers um, from outside of Seattle and the kind of Washington area. Uh, many of those folks, I think half of our speakers won't uh, be here in person. So um, they're gonna give their presentations via Zoom. Um, and that creates a unique opportunity for us to kind of co-create what the class format will look like. So we're gonna do a little bit of that here today, even though I kind of tried to address it in the announcement. Um, so the basics are, I've kind of gone over this, one credit class, um, 400 level students, will have to submit um, five reflections over the course of the eight core uh, guest speaker sessions. And then if you're in the 500 level, you just do a summative paper at the end. Uh, 400 level students will also do a kind of large overview at the end uh, that sort of sums up your experience as well. So really, probably the, one of the simplest classes that you'll take at UW. Um, getting into the juicy details, we do have these eight expert uh, guest seminar presenters who are going to start presenting next week. So I'm going to kind of bookend uh, our seminar session with this intro today. I'll also give a closing um, session the last week just to kind of um, engage in a larger discussion with you all and to tie up all of the themes that we've seen throughout all of the um, guest presenters. Um, so we're kind of following the food system as you'll see, um, and we'll talk about that a bit more um, today when we just kind of overview the theme. Um, but we're really kind of looking at certifications from the production side of the food system all the way up through um, retail and consumption. And we'll actually end with a presentation from the UW Sustainability Office to talk about how certifications are taken into account um, here on campus. And I think that's gonna be a great opportunity as well for y'all as members of the community to um, advocate for uh, the integration of certifications that you are particularly passionate about or think should be integrated into um, kind of UW purchasing protocols. Um, and there already are some that exist, so that'll be a part of that session. Um, some sessions that I do really wanna point out, uh, we have two pretty famous and well-known speakers who are gonna be presenting. I kind of like send out all these emails in the fall and like hope for the best. Um, and in the particular case of the Regenerative Organic Certification and Fair Trade USA, the directors and founders decided that they wanted to give the presentations themselves. So um, for January 27th, um, scaling the regenerative organic agriculture certification. We've got Elizabeth Whitlow, who's the executive director of that uh, organization and the certification that came out of it. And then on February 10th, um, Fair Farms through Fair Trade USA, we've got Paul Rice, who's the founder and CEO of Fair Trade USA. Um, and Paul Rice in particular is extremely well known and very famous internationally. Um, for his work in fair trade. He's been in um, that space for a number of decades. Um, and we're, again, super lucky to get to hear from these folks directly. Although, of course, um, Elizabeth, I think, I think they're, they might both be in California. I know Paul is in Oakland, and I'm pretty sure um, Elizabeth is somewhere on the West Coast as well. So those will be via Zoom, but um, get ready. It's going to be really exciting. I sort of feel like a food certification groupie, like, you know, getting sort of nervous and excited about them presenting to the group. Um, and we have a lot of other really wonderful presenters, but I just really wanted to highlight those two in particular. Um, but all the other folks presenting are involved in really important work um, in food certifications. And then this is to point out that um, of the eight expert guest seminars, four are gonna be physically here in person. At least that's the current plan. So this is like the big caveat. Um, we've set the plans for them to show up on campus um, and barring any kind of health issues or logistical issues, otherwise they'll plan to be here. So next week, the week after, uh, we'll have one in-person speaker um, in February, Donnie Wilcox from Wilcox Farms. I don't know how many people um, know about Wilcox Farms? Any folks? I actually, sometimes I buy their eggs, so I'm also excited to have Donnie here um, in person to talk about his work. 
Uh, but then in February, most of our sessions will be uh, remote presenters via Zoom. And then, of course, UW Sustainability will be here in person in March. So we'll have four in person and four remote. And this is where I want to pull the audience. So again, folks who are listening to the recording, please weigh in. Uh, we want to hear your choice. Um, the options are for those Zoom days to only host the class remotely via Zoom. So that means cobwebs in this room, nobody's here, it's just empty and quiet. Or the second option, host the class in person. So you would still have the option to kind of come in here and we would um, stream the Zoom lecture live. So there could be people at home or other, uh, otherwise participating via Zoom, but you could also come here and be physically present. Okay, this is really good to know. So right now folks are weighing in um, that they would prefer um, to only host the class remotely via Zoom, at least that's where the majority is. Um, and it looks like we, we have maybe two thirds of the class here today um, who are registered. Um, so again, folks who are listening to the recording, please weigh in. Um, but this is really helpful. And I know, you know, y'all have a ton of experience at this point, for better or worse, dealing with kind of hybrid, asynchronous, synchronous, like all different flavors of technology set up for these types of situations. So if y'all think that it would work best to have everybody tune in via Zoom, which is kind of what it looks like, um, then we will plan to do that. Um, and Ali and I, if this is the final decision, I'll let people know via an announcement and kind of reinforce that during our sessions, then we'll be um, sort of very regular with our communication about that. So um, everybody knows what's happening the week that we're having Zoom sessions um, and when to pop in when we do have folks in person. Any questions? Yes. Yes, so right now, Panopto is recording this lecture. Um, and the days when there are Zoom presentations, if the final decision, which again, it looks like it is preliminarily, is to just host class remotely via Zoom, on those days, because the Panopto recording will be blank, essentially, um, we will post the Zoom recording of the session to the cloud, and that will sync up to our Canvas site. Good question. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I wasn't sure what the class preference was going to be um, between these two options, but it looks like we kind of have a clear winner. Any other questions about that? You're welcome to send notes to Ali and I if you want to follow up, um, but hopefully this meets everyone's needs. Whatever's going on for you, whether there are health issues, personal issues, whatever, you should, the, the goal is for you to be able to access the recordings, whatever format it's in. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your preferences. That makes it easier for us to, and I think also for the Zoom presenters, it's always kind of weird to like toggle between in person, have like a camera on y'all, but then <laughs> Zoom up here. Things can get kind of weird. Um, so we're going to dive into an overview of the food system. I realize that we do have a good number of food systems, nutrition and health folks, and also public health folks. Uh, people who also may and likely do have an interest in the food system in general. So this may be um, fairly basic for some folks, but I want to make sure for people coming from computer science and biology um, and other parts of campus that we're sort of all on the same page. And so I've taken this simple and yet complex framework, which if anyone's been in uh, my classes before, you may have seen this one before. It's from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And I encourage you to kind of look at it in detail more when you have the time, because it's really complex. Every time I look at it, I kind of draw new insights from all of the different components here. So in the center, we have um, outcomes of a uh, sustainable food system, essentially social, economic, and environmental pillars of sustainability, which are listed as resilience, equity, um, sustainability, arguably somewhat redundant, uh, stability, security, profit, well-being, health, productivity, and protection. And then um, on the upper side of this diagram 
above the, the kind of uh, food supply chain, we've got all of these different drivers of the outcomes. So infrastructure, society and culture, profit and shared prosperity, the economy, politics and policies, research development and innovation, biophysics and the environment, energy, power dynamics and equity, and demographics. So a lot of different drivers, um, and they all um, often have uh, synergistic effects when they intersect. Um, and then in the lower level, especially for folks who are maybe new to food systems, I would recommend that you really focus in here and kind of think about these different categories. So we've got pre-production and production, which is um, within the land, agriculture, and within other spaces. Um, it may be foraging and harvesting. Um, it may be fishing or aquaculture in the oceans. Uh, Post-production, which kind of includes all of the sort of transit and logistics aspects of the food system. Um, and then we've got consumption, which includes uh, the selling and then the eating or preparing, eating and preparing of foods. And then finally, we've got loss, waste, and disposal. So what happens um, at the end of the food system. If we're thinking of a food system as linear, um, I'm hoping to change your mind about that. The goal is to kind of create more of a circular economy within food. But what happens to kind of bring uh, food loss and food waste um, back into the food supply chain, uh, whether that's in pre-production and production or perhaps on the consumption side? So these are all kind of basic components of the food system at the bottom. And then again, we've got the drivers up in the top and the sort of very optimistic outcomes in the center. So I'd love for you to refer back to this diagram, even if you've seen it before, as we're going through the seminar, and especially as we get to the end when you're kind of trying to put it all together um, and sort of formulate your own perspective on um, the extent to which and maybe how and where uh, food certifications play a role in enhancing sustainability across uh, all of these different parts of the food system. Okay, and so um, when we talk about sustainability, I like to present a fairly simplistic but really useful diagram um, of the kind of three spheres of sustainability. And so our, our chart back here, actually, um, in the center, the outcomes are kind of based on these, they call them three pillars. In some literature, they're called um, spheres. I kind of prefer the spheres. Um, so uh, social, economic, and environmental pillars or social, economic, and environmental spheres, they're overlapping and intersecting. Um, and I'm just gonna share some sort of broad categories of areas within each of these spheres that you may be aware of um, when we talk about sustainability in the food system. And of course, there's many more. And actually, in the, in the next part of our session, I'm gonna ask y'all to kind of participate in sharing what you know about the different spheres of sustainability in the food system. So in the social category, we've got um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I've studied gender equity in this space in particular, um, but there are other really important um, aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion that need to be considered when we're looking at food system sustainability. Um, human rights, and again, some of these kind of bleed together into um, similar issues. Human rights, health and nutrition issues, so that category in and of itself, you know, is a whole um, area of focus, food security, food sovereignty, these types of uh, topics. Labor issues, and even within labor issues, there are many um, sub-issues. Uh, and then governance as well can be included in the social sphere. Um, and I worked a lot in the government governance space when I was working with cooperatives. So the farmers' cooperatives were nested into federations, um, and a really powerful aspect of sustainability within those organizations was the way that they um, created democratic governance structures so that farmers could participate in uh, all kinds of decision-making processes. Um, the next sphere is environmental. This is the one most people think of when they think about sustainability. Um, and this includes very broadly resource use, so land, water, energy, um, issues of biodiversity protection and or loss, 
food loss and waste in particular when we talk about the food system, and then climate change, kind of this overarching issue affecting all other issues within the environmental sphere. And of course, there are many others, and I'm hoping that you um, will kind of crowd chair that in this next part. And then finally, the economic sphere. And I think probably economic and social are the two least explored when we talk about um, environmental sustainability, or excuse me, sustainability overall. Um, but you'll see that when we explore um, the vast majority of the certifications this quarter, um, both of these are really integral. And so in the economic sphere, we have the cost of production. So you know, at the level of the farmer or the farm worker, um, what does it cost to produce the food that then makes it into the local, the regional, national, or global economy? We have issues of fair wages and livelihoods that kind of cross cut with some of the social issues um, that are listed here. And then also the cost of goods for consumers, right? And you know, there's a lot of issues with inflation happening right now, and I think uh, people are sort of more, more concerned or aware about that um, at this point. Um, but you can see that uh, the economic sphere in particular is very complex, um, and sort of uh, issues in each section can't be addressed without the other. So it'll be fascinating to hear um, from our speakers and how they kind of present the ways in which uh, the certifications that they're representing touch on um, these spheres and also some of the concepts in the previous framework that I shared. Okay, so this is where I'd like y'all to participate. Um, we're going to start with agriculture, which encomp encompasses pre-production and also production. So uh, for farmers in the field, for folks working um, in the seas in aquaculture or um, fish and shellfish farming, what are major issues that you're aware of or major challenges? So I'd like you all to um, share the issues that you're aware of or that you might have a particular interest in, major challenges in agriculture from pre-production through production. And there's a lot here, so dig in, pun intended. And as you do this, try to think about the three spheres. So the social sphere of sustainability, the environmental sphere. I see a lot of environmental issues coming up, although a lot more social ones just popped up as well, and economic. Awesome. This is great. Fantastic. We're going to refer back to these at the end of the quarter, and I think it'll be a really interesting time capsule for everyone. OK, great. And I love that at the center of this, we ended up seeing Climate, wages, labor, this is great. Okay, fantastic. And not to sound like a broken record, but for folks who are listening, y'all can also add in. Um, thanks to people here for participating live. Okay, keep going if you have more to add. Uh, the next uh, part of the food system that we're going to look at is processing and manufacturing. So this is kind of post-production, and this encompasses a lot of uh, the logistics around getting food from the farm or the place where it's produced to the other place. Um, and perhaps in, in some instances, the actual the processing of food into other formats. Um, so this is where you can share major challenges in food processing and manufacturing uh, in the post-production part of the food system. Food safety, yes. Excellent. And again, we see a whole host of uh, distinct, um, yet sometimes connected issues that arise within this particular phase of the food system. So when we're actually processing the raw ingredients, um, shipping them, transporting them. Um, this is great. A lot of focus on food safety, ventilation, hygiene, exposure, and again, kind of draw on the social, environmental, and also economic aspects of this. This is great. And I know a lot of folks in the audience also um, are very interested or have studied this topic in detail. So good to have your perspectives here. OK, excellent. Keep adding these. Um, and we'll, we'll try to post these as well so you can refer back to them. OK, we're going to move on to 
the next part of the food system. So I've kind of combined um, food retail and consumption uh, from the diagram. So what might happen in a restaurant, in a grocery store, um, but what might also happen, let's say, in your home kitchen, for example, um, with issues, uh, major challenges in food retail and consumption. Um, and this didn't necessarily come up in the diagram, but this could also include um, consumer education and, and awareness, for sure, which is a theme that will come up, especially, uh, I think, in all of the presentations we'll hear, but in particular towards the end. Waste, yes. Think of me standing with a clipboard in front of a dump truck, dumping a whole bunch of food waste, um, so much waste from uh, the retail and, you know, the home, home environment as well. We're lucky in Seattle that we... Uh, have residential composting. Excellent. So many. Y'all are great. This is fantastic. Overconsumption issues, education, accessibility, refrigeration. You know, refrigeration is another one in post production that, that's an issue um, at a systems level. Fantastic. So again, thinking about social issues, environmental issues, economic issues. A lot of challenges here. Okay, thanks y'all for participating. This is really great. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So we're kind of getting towards the end of our session for today. Um, this is really just a get you oriented and get you thinking and also get you excited for our guest speakers coming up. So I've kind of organized the logos of all of the certifications that we're going to get to hear about um, this quarter into the framework that we've been discussing. So within the food system, we've got pre-production and production, which is kind of at the farm level. We've got processing, which is more, you know, think about the factory, think about shipping and transport. And then we've got retail and consumption. So again, restaurants, grocery stores, your own uh, home kitchen, uh, your pantry, your refrigerator. Um, and so you can see that we're almost, we've almost got it like perfectly in order in terms of uh, our, our presenters. We're going to hear about uh, the mainstreaming of the organic certification next week which is really exciting, um, from the organics program manager at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. So we'll kind of get this um, state level, but um, this person also liaises at the, uh, the federal level with the USDA um, organic program as well. So we'll kind of get the perspective also of how um, state level certifications, uh, historically, many of which came into existence before USDA orga organic, uh, was a thing. So um, California was the first state to have an organic certification. That certification still exists. Um, Oregon still has its own. Washington still has its own. And there are a couple other states that still operate their own state level certifications. Um, and those all um, informed the creation and development of USDA organic. So I don't want to get into too much detail uh, before next week. Uh, but I think that's why it'll be particularly interesting to hear from somebody at the state level uh, talking about the certification. Um, and what's really fascinating about USDA Organic is it has been, uh, it's internationally recognized. So uh, many organic producers in other countries specifically go after the USDA Organic certification because it kind of has this for lack of a better word, it has this like international brand appeal as being the kind of best in, best in class. Um, there are some folks, you know, depending on their orientation, may prefer USDA organic versus the EU designation. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, uh, we won't learn specifically about the Japanese organic designation, but that is um, the strictest globally. So if you have that designation, you have really um, had to sort of jump through a number of different regulatory um, and sort of processing hoops to um, get that mark. So starting um, in pre-production and production, um, we'll learn about USDA organic, again, which has been in operation for a couple decades now. Um, regenerative organic, how many folks have heard the term regener regenerative organic? And you can just kind of show a raise of hands. 
Okay, just a couple folks. So this is like a very new certification. I think they started their pilot in 2017 or 18. Um, tricky timing because the pandemic hit sort of in the middle of it, but they've gone through at least one round of pilot testing and they might even have done a second round. I don't know, we'll find out from um, Elizabeth when she presents to us, um, but it's essentially a certification that takes the organic standard um, and sort of moves the, the post quite a bit forward. Um, and it looks specifically at regenerative organic practices, hence the name. Um, and we'll learn more about those practices from Elizabeth, but they really focus very generally, um, just to give you a little intro, on soil health and creating, um, creating healthy soil for not only productive capacity, but also for carbon sequestration as well. So that'll be really fascinating. Um, we'll also learn about sustainability efforts and certification schemes in the context of the food that we get from the ocean landscape. So um, really big here on the West Coast, of course, and in many places around the world, aquaculture, um, the natural uh, fishing, wild fishing, wild caught fishing, and also farming. Uh, how many folks have seen the MSC certification standard before? Anyone recognize that? Okay, cool. We're actually, we're really lucky because I think they have a major office, um, you know, they're based out of, um, I believe it's Monterey, um, but they have a major office in this area. So we're, we're supposed to have somebody here live, which is very cool, the kind of West Coast, or a Pacific Northwest representative. Um, and then we have also in pre-production and production, uh, we've got certified humane, um, which means how animals, um, so for animal products, how animals are raised and also handled. And this cross cuts um, land-based animals. So we've got the chickens, we've got the ducks, we've got the pigs, we've got the cows. Uh, it may also include sheep and goats, although I'm not sure. Um, we can get into those types of questions um, with Donnie Wilcox, who um, is the sustainability, uh, the main sustainability person at Wilcox Farm. So the cool thing about that session is we're not gonna hear from somebody who manages the certification, but we're gonna actually hear from um, a farmer in this area, they're very close to Seattle, who uh, manages the certification and we'll hear his perspective on why they do it, why it's important, how it's changed their practices. So I think that'll be uh, particularly fascinating. Um, and then of course, we're gonna have Paul Rice talk about Fair Trade USA and the evolution, which the history is really fascinating, the evolution of fair trade um, from its advent until now, and specifically what Fair Trade USA, which is a separate organization from Fair Trade International, is focused on um, here in the USA. And I'm actually getting ready to submit a manuscript um, based on my research with the first uh, fair trade certified farm in the US. It's actually located um, near the border with Mexico in Southern Arizona. Um, so I, again, I'm so excited to hear from Paul about their work in this space and sort of the implications of having fair trade certified farms in the United States. Um, there's some overlap here with the logos because some of these certifications, as I'm sure you'll find out, kind of overlap into different categories in the food system. So within the processing space, certified humane and fair trade um, also um, has implications on processors and processors can be certified as well. Um, and then we have uh, two other certifications we'll learn about, upcycled certified, which is from the upcycled uh, food, I think they're called an alliance, maybe association, I should really know this. Um, but they essentially certify food, food companies or food businesses that have taken food from the food system in places where it would otherwise have been lost. So um, Imperfect Foods is a good example of an upcycled certified company. There are different food products. If you go into the grocery store and kind of check, a lot of like dried fruits, um, some different grain products are, uh, have the upcycled certification. This is really, really brand new. I think they've only started certifying in the last two years. So um, this is something sort of very up and coming that we're gonna get to learn about. And then we've got um, the Certified B Corporation. So you may have also seen this logo um, on some companies around town. 
Um, and there are a lot more um, nationally and internationally. Patagonia, for example, not within the food system, but a really famous company is B certified. Uh, in the food system, we've got large corporations like Danone, and we also have um, smaller businesses, local businesses here, like Frankie and Joe's, the vegan ice cream shop. Um, and then finally, in retail and consumption, um, this is where there's some uh, cross-cutting uh, issues that are addressed from the certified B Corporation model. Uh, but then we also ha will have an example from UW Sustainability about how um, certifications are integrated into um, the campus environment through purchasing and other, um, other modalities. So this is what we have to look forward to. And again, I hope you're as excited as I am. And perhaps if you're not that excited right now, um, maybe some of the speakers will pique your interest. Um, but I would like to present a challenge to each of you um, since you're in this seminar. Um, as you go through the course of the winter quarter and you're out there buying things, whether, you know, ideally food, because this whole seminar is about food, but certainly this cross cuts other areas. Fair trade shows up on uh, cotton products and textile products, for example. Um, pay attention to uh, the foods that you purchase, uh, especially the ones that are packaged, and look for logos. And just kind of take note. Don't try to do it intentionally or anything, but just take note of any of the foods that you might buy or see in grocery stores or in other environments that have um, some of the logos that we'll talk about. And perhaps there are other new ones that you'll see, because um, this is really just a sort of snapshot of some very core certifications. But the certification world has really proliferated in the last couple of decades. Um, so that's my challenge to you. Um, and if you find anything particularly interesting, um, do share it with Ali and I, and feel free to write about it as well um, in your reflections for the course. OK, so to gear us up for next week, um, we've got Brenda Book, the Organic Program Manager from Washington State Department of Agriculture, who's going to be talking about mainstreaming organics through the USDA certification in Washington and also beyond. Uh, we're currently scheduled to have her here in person. If anything changes, I will let you know. And either way, um, I will let you know through uh, Canvas announcement next week. So again, really excited to have all of you participating this quarter. It's going to be really fun, and I'll look forward to seeing you all next week.